went to court, got a fine, bang, and just, ca- just changed my tag again, and then <laughs> oh, carried on, you know. I and then don't... eventually, yeah, eventually we got sentenced. We got eight months sentences, did four months inside, and then just came out and carried on again. You need the Kellervision app. 24-7 mini documentaries, podcasts, live shows, DJ live streams, top five, subscription packages, plus products for all your podcasts and street culture sports. Download it from the App Store for free today. Instagram UK Frontline. Beatbox created. Killer Keller. And we need to talk about world music and street culture. Killer Keller Podcast. This is the Killer Keller Podcast coming to you live. Central London, central as you need to be, should be, or even want to be. Yeah, you know this. Big shout out to graffitikings.co.uk. Hold tight to the regulars, you know, sharing is caring, we're keeping it moving like that. If you haven't checked out the Kellervision app, then you're severely missing the heavy dose of street culture that you need 24-7 in your life. Free download. All right? So, uh, yeah, get involved. All app stores. Uh, I mean, <laughs> the privy is all mine and yours. We've got some legacy holding going on over here. We're coming out of London, getting into the more rural areas, the, the Berkshire Manors and all these other um, places that often get slept on. But, man, flame holding torch for a long time man like wrench inside the place how are you brother i'm good kels man good to see you You all right (laughs) yeah i'm good thank you thank you for the invite thanks very much hey how's that for an intro ain't too far from the truth now come on well i don't know i don't like to blow my own trumpet too much but i've been around i've been around you know what i mean (laughs) that's what i'm here to do i'm here to blow the trumpet (laughs) so yeah thanks for the invite it all happened a bit randomly didn't it you know yeah big shout out charles charles wasn't expecting it it yeah man like charles He gets around, him. gets around, doesn't he? Yeah, but he was just down my local spot on a Saturday and I bumped into him. I hadn't seen him for about 10 years, maybe. We had a little chat and he was like, you got to do Keller, man. you got to do Keller. You hear that? You hear that? That's the word and, uh, on the street. <laughs> so, yeah. And then you hit me up and we made it happen, didn't we? And, yeah, I'm here, man. And thank you, man. I know it's a trek. I know you... Uh, no, it's not too you bad. You weathered I'm, the storm I'm, out there. I'm up at, yeah, I weathered the storm. It's <laughs> fucking pissing it down out there, <laughs> I'm up here all the time, you know. Mm. Not not really for graph business these days, but uh, just work business. Just other business. So, yeah, it's that business. I'm around. I'm everywhere. Is it that? Is it that? You, actually, I'm going to throw this question out immediately. You know, you, you, the, the differentiation of and the way the world's turned and you, the, you, your occupation now. Is there are there aspects of? Um, not that you need to get into your work at all, but are there aspects of your work where you could say, man, like, had I thought about this when I was, you know, 15, 16, getting into graph, da, 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 that the world would be the way it is now for you? Could, could you imagine that journey? Like, it, it must be uh, quite a trip. No, it was when I was 15 and 16 and, and writing, or just getting started. That was the very early days. That was where the seeds were getting planted. But I wasn't thinking about anything mm-hmm. <laughs> back then. <laughs> You know, yeah. I wasn't thinking about anything. It was just day at a time, you know. Mm. I was starting to get into graph, starting to get into hip-hop. And that was all I cared about, you know. And then that was the sort of... That was the beginning, you know. And it all came from there. And it's just changed and evolved as, as I've got older, you know. Look at things very, very differently now, of course. You know, mm. a lot of stuff's happened in the last 30 years. Um but no, back then, definitely not thinking about much at all. And especially as I started to get a bit older, 17, mm. 18, 19, yeah. just absolutely graffiti obsessed. Graffiti you know. obsessed. For I mean, those of you who don't know, once, oh, t- let's just give me up to speed here. For those of you who don't know about the wrench man, uh, former heavy artillery, uh, most certainly holding it down. All rounder, bombing. Yeah, definitely. Trains, definitely. walls. All the fames, yeah, all over the Everything. shop. Everything, travelling yeah. about, you know, going to different countries. Yeah, yeah, tracks, trains, walls, yeah. you name it. Yeah, yeah, you really embraced the whole three sixty circumference. Yeah, because I was, to me, that was what it was all about. That was what the illegal thing was. What sort of attracted me to it in yeah. the first place, you know, when when I saw writers around my way, the people that sort of inspired me. Mm. I used to get the train to school every day. You know, it was only it was only like a couple of stops, but that was when I first started noticing 
dubs and tags. You know, this is sort of like 1990, and I was just like, what is, you know, what's going on there? What's going on there? Mm-hmm. And at the same time, I was getting into hip hop and seeing, uh, you know, they used to have the peace book section in the back of Hip Hop Connection. But biblical, that. Yeah, you know, that was biblical. where, that was what got <laughs> so many people into it. Yeah. You know, and it was sort of just starting to join the dots together, aren't you? Yeah. And then one day, one day um, we arrived at the station I used to get off at for school and it had been absolutely obliterated. Who know? was the writers? Well, this was just a local crew called KAS. I mean, most people would never have heard, heard of them unless you were from, from my neck of the woods. And they weren't really, they weren't really doing burners or full colour pieces or anything. They were literally a crew of bombers mm. and, and, and dub uh, trackside writers. But they had done dubs over the whole station, throw-ups over the whole station, and I was just like, wow, that is amazing. I want to go, you know. Mm. And it was literally, that was one of the big spark, and it was like, right, I'm going to get some paint. Wow. And, you know, I think I bought my first my first couple of cans because I didn't even really know about racking. I didn't even know about Subway Art and Spray Can Art at that point. Mm. And then a couple of, you know, I started doing tags around my, my area and my school and then a couple of other kids found out, oh, that's him doing it, you know. And they come, oh, is that you doing those tags? And it was like, yeah, it's me, yeah. Oh, yeah, have you got Subway Art? And I was like, no, what, what's, what's Subway Art? What's, you oh, know. that's amazing, OK. You know, I didn't have a, didn't have a clue, you know. There, there was no, there wasn't really any major graph around my area. There was bits and pieces, but it wasn't, like I say, it wasn't like being in central mm. London or even Brighton or Bristol, you know. Yeah, you more you 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 had to find it. You had to find it, yeah. So there was stuff on the tracks, and you know, later on, I found out that there had been a Hall of Fame at, um, in Reading in the sort of late eighties. But I'd I'd never been there. What was the name of that? That was called uh, Meadway, and that's where like Kiwi and the Parkside Kings used to paint. Oh, uh, tight. DRA Death Row artists, um, TZC Twilight Zone crew. Who are, Good friends of mine. This is fucking incredible because this, this is like know. these like names that just have not come up on the podcast. Before. No, they won't. That's fire. Love it. Yeah, they, I mean there was loads of stuff, and these people, some of them weren't anything ever more than local writers, but they inspired. They still inspired a generation. Mm. You know, they inspired. They inspired me, and they, you know, I've I've then on maybe gone on to inspire other people as well. Mm. And there's a really healthy scene. Um, in the in the area that I live in, you know, and mm. you know that's thanks that's thanks to Kiwi and the Parkside Kings and DRA and TZC and and whoever else, you know. But it's it's a good it's a good it's a good place to live. It's a good place to um to do graph, you know. Yeah. Um, I'd say a lot of stuffs a lot of stuffs happened over the years, but we the main sort of catalyst for me was when a guy, a good friend of mine. Um, moved to the to the area and he was only six months or so older than me mm. but I say I didn't still didn't really know what I was doing and he moved to the to the area and he had come from uh, PWS territory mm, okay and he wasn't in PWS at that point but he knew all of those guys and he'd been mentored and he knew how to do a piece you know and he knew how to do track sides mm-hmm. and, and blah, 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 which I didn't know. And one day I was walking home from school and I had my tag blatantly all over my bag, like school kids do. <laughs> you know, the same tag that was all over the town. Yeah, yeah. And he's just come up behind me and gone, hello, you're so-and-so, are you? And I was like, yeah, who are you? And he was like, I'm so-and-so. And I was like, oh, right, you did that and you did that. And he was like, yeah, man, that's me. He's going, you want to go and do a piece sometime? And I was like, oh, I've never done a piece. And he was like, Okay. So how old were you at this time? I was, I was, I was, I think I was about 16. 16. Maybe just turned 16, just gone Mad. into the fifth year or I mean, year 11, or they call it now, don't they? Mm-hmm, yeah. Just gone into the fifth year at school. And so he was a bit older than me and he was at his first year at a local college. And this guy's a respected writer in his own right. This is the guy, well, I might as well say who he is. People can probably work it out, but you might not know. This is the guy who was Hooks TPG. Mm. Fuck! That's cool. TPG hooks. Come on. Yeah, the yeah. original TPG. Yeah, yeah, when it yeah. when it was when it was those four. You know, I'm not, I'm not gonna start dropping loads of names. We all know. So I'll pick them up later. <laughs> but that was that was the guy. You know, and he says he's a good friend of mine. We've we live yeah, in different nice. parts of the country now, and and we don't see each other like we used to. But he was my main writing partner, racking partner, 
Mm. And just smoking partner for years, you know, for a long, long time, you know. Man, that's crazy that to uh, talk about, you know, two worlds coming together. That must, when you think about that now, that must actually blow your mind that oh, yeah, yeah. somebody that was as prolific as that, you guys kind of bucking together and co the combination. So he wasn't, he wasn't hooks at that point. Okay. You know, this is, that was, that was That's probably, that was probably, that was probably three or four years later. Right. So this was like the, so the formative. Yeah. This, he, and he had, he had several names before that and he's had several names since, since as well, you know, hmm. and, um, top bloke, you know, top writer, really unique style, you know, taught me so much. Like, we really good, real, real good pal of mine. Mm. We went to, we got caught, caught together. We went to prison together uh, for doing trains. And we got, we got a lot of history. And we, you know, we used to, used to inspire each other, you know, mm. as you do when you've got a sort of, we're like, you know, when you've got a Starsky and Hutch kind of writing yeah. duo. Yeah. And that's, that's what we were, you know. Shining Quest, hold tight, Shining Quest. When yeah, you said, as soon as you said quest, that, I thought yeah. that immediately. <laughs> but you know, wrenching hooks for years and wrenching lots of these other names that you know, because I've always been, I've always been been wrench, yeah. you know, since uh, nineteen ninety three. I think I've been wrench. Damn, that's a while, man. Yeah, yeah, it's good, it's good. But it was, you know, it was mad. You know, when we got when we got caught. You know, we had a court case that was going on for 11 months while BTP got their case together and everything. But we were so, as I was saying before about being obsessed and addicted to graph, we were so obsessed now at that point. It didn't even matter that we were on bail for serious criminal damage, you know, on bail to Crown Court and everything. We just carried on. Carried we on. We just changed our tags and carried on. We were doing trains, track sides, bombing insides the whole time while we were still on trial because we were... We were like 18, 19 years old and just didn't give a shit. That's dedication. Know? What's the theory on that? Is that in retrospect, now you can think about it from now I, now head. I look at Now I look at it and I think, fucking hell, that was mental. That was stupid, <laughs> <Yeah>. you know. <laughs> You're out of your mind. I, I even got caught. I got caught bombing Wimbledon train station, <clears> like, during that during that period as well. But they didn't, for somehow, you know, the, somehow the police, they don't link things together sometimes. So I was on bail for graffiti. They'd never even linked it up with that. I got caught, it was on camera, couldn't get away with it, went to court, got a fine, bang, and just, kept, just changed my tag again, and then <laughs> oh, carried on, you know. I and then eventually, yeah, eventually we got sentenced, we got eight months sentences, did four months inside, and then just came out and carried on again. I want to ask you what jail was like at that particular time of your life and in, in the, the, the decade it was, but... What, what goes? I mean, this is why I think graph writers, you know, not the street artists. We're talking about the hardcore. You're wired in a certain way, man. Yeah. It's it's it's, and I say that with all the, you know, affection in the world. Um. It, it's, it's only through these podcasts that I recognise this. Um, I've learned a lot, and one thing I still cannot. It's a hump I can't get over. And that is, if you're already being punished, to, yeah. you carry on. Is that like sorting a wound or is that just feeding the, the beast? It was neither, really. We no. just didn't care. Just didn't care. It didn't matter. The, the, only, the only thing that I hated about being inside was how much it hurt my family. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, I'm not, I'm not from the hood. I'm from a, a nice, nice family, parents with respectable jobs. My mum goes to church and all that kind of stuff. Mm. Uh, and that was the only thing that I found hard about it. But again, I was just an, a, a, a bit of a selfish teenager. And even though I just carried on, I thought as long as I don't get caught again and she doesn't find out, everything will be all right. Because mm. that's that sort of young mindset, isn't it? You know, Immortality. The, you just, yeah, that immortal <laughs> mindset. Yeah. Later on, you know, my attitudes have, have changed to graph over the years as I've got into other things and whatever because I've dipped in and out as well you know there's been mm. there's been a period where well, several times where I've given up for a year mm. not intentionally pardon me other things have come along uh you know did your mum see did your mum and dad see the 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 relevance in the art 
no. of it? No, they just I hated didn't it. see it. They hated, I hated it. Hated it. Hated it. Hated graffiti. Was that like? Did that? Did that impact your relationship with them long term? Um, yeah, it has done. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's a lot better now, but it cool. did do for a long time, for a long, long time. And I think you'll be the only one that suffers. That. I mean, there's a nonchalance to a lot of these conversations, but people out there that do do graph and do it to a level, I'm sure this these these. It, happen, it happens happen. a lot. Not you know. Some writers don't care. Some writers' parents don't care. Some you know. Mm. Uh, some people don't care what their what their parents think, and that's fine. You know, that's that's mm. up to you. But don't expect everyone to be the same as you. Mm-hmm. You know, so it did have it did have a big a big effect on me, and it's something that you you never forget. Not because it was particularly bad or anything. I didn't get beaten up or mm. or any of that kind of stuff. You know, we were kind of lucky that there was three there was three of us that got sent down together. And when you go to jail and there's three of you and you've got two codes, mm. already you're crewed up, aren't you? You know. Yeah. So you're like, a lot of people are in jail on their own. So mm. straight away when there's three of you, they're like, well, there's already there's three of them. Yeah. You know, I'm not if I start on one, then I'm starting on, on all three. So generally we got left alone because we were our own little sort of our own little unit. Yeah, yeah. And we got to know people and it was mad. We turned out there was people in there that were friends with People in PWS and, you know, one guy lived across the road from Kicker and PWS and this and that. And there's other people like, oh, yeah, my mate writes so-and-so. Do you know him? And I was like, hey, you know, yeah, I know him. <laughs> you know, it's... He must have been a mad time because they were really pulling in people. Like BTP, would, uh, this was well, an this era, was this wasn't it? era where they first started really bagging writers. So we were talking you know, like 95, 90s? Mid-90s, yeah. 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 And uh, the way that they would really get these sentences was quite ridiculous because the damage that you would get charged for, like every every charge you had for graffiti would have like a bill with it almost. You know, they were saying that charge is for £16,314. That charge is for 32000 whatever. You think, okay, well, hang on. I, I, when, I, when I got done, I had five main charges and I had 37 other charges to be taken into consideration. Because you know they were working on it for eleven months. They were Dazed going around. On it. Yeah, they were tracking That's a lot, though. They were tracking. They were tracking wow. us down. But getting back to the point of the money, I had one charge, and they said that one charge was a hundred and twenty thousand pounds. One charge, and that that what that was one night was when they had the train strikes back in ninety three and ninety two, ninety three. We used to take a bite to them, like a lot of writers did. And there was one night where two whole cars got done and, and about four panels. Now, you're telling me it costs £120,000 to clean yeah. two whole cars and four yeah. panels? It doesn't. But what they used to do is they would charge you for the loss of revenue while that train was being cleaned. And that became... That was how they calculated that cost. So you're getting done for £120,000 worth of damage. It's not £120,000 worth of damage. It's whatever plus your loss of revenue. But the judge don't care about it, does he? The judge just looks at that and goes... Hundred and twenty thousand pounds. Yeah. You know. You're Something. in trouble, son. You yeah, know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Especially when you've got thirty seven TICs as well. Yeah. So, you know, they didn't really have a lot of option. We were stupid and young at that point as well. When they raided us, they got everything. You know, they had photos of us doing trains, they had tons of paint, nozzles, outlines, mm-hmm. the works. You know, we we couldn't there was no way we were getting out of it. Um but so we yeah. And we were made an example of, really. Didn't really work, but mm. that's what they were trying to do. I mean, we were unlucky as well because they had one of the one of the BTP officers from the our local BTP was in the London Graph Squad at one point. Uh-huh. So he knew the crack. Right. Whereas the local BTP were like, oh, what's all this spraying on yeah. trains? They didn't get it. And he was like, these lads are in a crew together. See these three letters? That's a crew. And he's this and he's that. And they, you know, and he helped them put it all together. And this was a time where that stuff just was not. It, it wasn't, wasn't rife like it is now. Known, yeah. No, it was it was starting to become known. You know, mm. Graf had been around for a few years and people had done trains, but the 90s was, was when the trains started getting really hammered, mm. wasn't it? You know, with the people on the South Coast who we've mentioned already and yeah. in London, obviously, always and forever. But yeah, it was uh, it was pretty mad times back then. Good times. Did you best, enjoy it? Be- oh yeah, best times of your life. You always say they enjoy it, no matter how much. You- <laughs> no matter how many times you got arrested, you know, because mm. we used to get nicked all the time mm. for 
amount of things we got away with. You know, Did the racking come into play as oh, well? Yeah, yeah because like... as um, other people have said on this show, if you didn't rack in the 90s, yeah. you couldn't be a prolific graffiti writer unless yeah. you had rich, super rich parents. If you wanted to get up and do and paint every other day, or you needed them. You, you had to get. You had to rack. There was absolutely no option mm. whatsoever. We used to go racking every single Saturday daytime because we were at college and and school and yeah. and things like that in the week. We used to bunk off and you know you go and rack a few cans in your lunch break and stuff sometimes. But say every Saturday we had our routines and we had set routes. We had the like the Oxford route. Yeah. We had the Guildford route. I was about to say, that had, actually, from where you're situated, yeah, we, we, there's, there's a we lot could, of scope. We could go in all different areas. So we could rotate them so that by the time you got back round to that route again, you hadn't been there for a little while and it had calmed down again mm. a bit. And we, I mean, you look back now and you think, how the hell did a bunch of teenagers get away with doing that? We used to go into this shop, well, several shops. You know, every route that we had, we would, would have three or four towns on it and there might be two, three or four paint shops in mm. every town. That's why we'd target them. And you'd go there, and, and there'd be four of us. We used to go in a, in a team of four. Two people who would go in, rack as much as they could, come out. The other two would then go in, rack as much as they could, come out. The first two would then go back in again about 15 minutes later, rack another load, get as much as they could, and come back out again. And but didn't then, they get recognised? Didn't they? I, this, well, the thing, we used to do that, and we never, you know, I've... The you suddenly see the, rack, the stuff off the shelves gone. Well... I think there's a lot of the time in these paint shops on a Saturday, they were normally quite busy. They were dis dealing with customers. Yeah. You should take advantage of that. Yeah. We'd sort of you'd cover each other and do do all the racking tricks that the people out there who've done it know. I mean, some in some paint shops, the, the paint would be in such a stupid place. You'd mm. think, thanks for putting it there. You know, there was one, <laughs> like I remember, where the paint was at the back of the shop underneath the stairs. I'll so, take that, thank you very much. So we used yeah. to just go in there and... Cl and Clear it out, you know, and just take as much as you could carry. And you'd be walking out the shop. That's mad. We used to go and rack more bags from Woolworths because we had so much paint, we didn't have enough bags to carry it home. We're talking so about these pick and mix bags, baby. We're talking, <laughs> about, the, we're talking about the big yeah. bags. It was Woolworths, before Woolworths Ikea. used to sell like, <laughs> like your travel bags and stuff like that. Yeah. And we'd go and rack a load of them just to put more paint in so that we'd carry it home. And we were racking like every Saturday between the four of us at least 100 cans. Every Saturday. Well, that's still not a lot of paint, you know. When you think about it between well, four I people. I know, but, but I'm just saying, no, at, at least 100. 100 cans it... would be a bad day, you know. On, okay. a, on a good day, you might get 200 cans. But I'm, I'm putting it in context because I'm, 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 you know, joking and saying, well, fuck, that's a lot, and you get away with it. But when you think about it, the fact being four people, you do need a lot of paint to you be do. able to and do that your might be twenty. That might be 25 cans. That might be 25 cans. But that's 25 cans each for the week. And plus, remember, you did it the week before, and every week you're doing different amounts of stuff. Yeah. We were painting most nights, but some nights it would only be a can of black and a can of crime, wouldn't it? Mm. And that would all be, be all you're taking out. Mm. So it wasn't like we were doing... But we, we, we might go and do... Trying not do burners. We were trying to do burners at that point. We weren't that good. But every Sunday we might go to a Hall of Fame or we would come up to London mm. and, and go to Tufnell and uh, Labyrinth Grove and wherever, you know. Can I just say at this point, I, 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 I used to love Tufnell Hall of Fame. Tufnell was the best. That was so good. And that underrated favorite, as well, yeah. man. Yeah, was, yeah. You know what I mean? What I liked about Tufnell, I know we're digressing a bit now, but it was, it, it, was always, uh, it was always a nice vibe up there. That's right. I don't know what about it. It was like everyone was super chilled, even though, like, you know, loads of DDS and that were, were all from around that area. But they didn't really seem to mind too much about us going up there and, and doing stuff. They're probably thinking, oh, I'll take it out tomorrow. But we didn't care. We just mm. wanted to do our piece at Tough and all, take a photo and go home. You know, and we used to speak to Sub and Petro and people like that. And mm. it was a good place for everyone to meet. You know, the writers from Essex would come in, the writers from, uh, you know, north of London. Mm. So. PWS territory and and beyond and um, would come in uh, writers from South Coast and Kent and mm. whatever and everyone would sort of you know meet up and you'd be you'd meet loads of people there you know I used to I've lost it now but I used to have a black book that I used to take up there and I had everyone in it absolutely everyone the amount of people that I met there you know you know one day Drax would be down and with with Robbo and and things like that and then the next weekend you'd go there and like Act and TBF would be there and people like that. And then another time you'd go there and... Mad. You know, React and the Essex boys and that would be there. 
It was great, you know, real, real good, really good times back then. I used to really, really enjoy coming up to London, just to say to learn as as well, you know, because uh, eventually I did, I stopped painting it in London. Not really for any particular reason. I was quite happy with painting locally. I think mm. I sort of started learning my trade in London mm. to a degree, you know, coming well, up in here. Well, set skills of like how things... Oh, just seeing done. how things were done, you yeah, know, you'd yeah. ride around, you'd go to different halls of fame and you'd see... So, because locally there wasn't that much stuff for me to learn from. Yeah. There was magazines, but we started going up to London uh, because we you know you were people were telling you about places, and then things like uh, visual graphics and that came out. You know, shouts to Kilo yeah, for doing that like because Kilo. putting that, videos out quick, please. That, hurry up. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to see some of those again. There's a couple on YouTube, but they're they're great. You know, yeah, yeah. but they you know we we found out about loads of places on. In London, that from there, you know, yeah. it would be like Crystal Palace, West Ham, and we'd be like, oh, "There's a place at Crystal Palace. Didn't know about that. Let's go down there." I mean, some weekends we just, we'd just some weekends we'd just be taking photos and be bomb. You know, we'd bomb on our way in and bomb on our way out, but we didn't always do a piece. Sometimes yeah. we'd just be the graph tourist taking the photos, say, learning our learning our trade. And after a few years, you know, I uh, stopped coming up here, and I think I probably had a bit of time out, you know, from from graph. I think you know because I. I'm into loads of loads of stuff, not just graffiti. Mm -hmm. And um, and then I started just painting painting more locally. But yeah, I've learned a lot learned a lot from the from the London boys. You know, DDS would definitely be one of the main inspirations for me. Mm, just the intensity of the work. Yeah. Just. I mean, it's that, just real deal. You knew as soon as you see them, you just know it was real deal, didn't you? You know, there was, and still is the case. And I, I'm not. I, I mean, there, there are others, obviously, as of course, guys, yeah. But, but there was something about DDS that, that it was almost like the folklore was so entrenched, and how they all formed in it. Yeah, and, yeah. It's, it's 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 still great. You know, great, Chris. So they've they've, they've changed. They've changed and, and evolved. They've got loads of new members or whatever. But yeah. I mean, no, I don't think there's no writer in this country would dispute what a, what a great crew they are and how influential they are. You know, NT, NT, man. Yeah, NT. You know that I knew a couple of those guys are from the same area as me. Did a lot of stuff with them. Mm. That was how I sort of linked up with the big man in Brighton and Alta Arrow, Alta. all of those guys. You know. um, one thing about NT that struck me so hard was the the invention of styles that I just I just really had never seen before. And not, you know, Europe always used to be the, you know, they, they reinvented the, stuff, didn't they? They did. They they stuff, they, yeah. they took stuff that they'd seen on their travels and they brought it back and and flipped it. You know, flipped it. Yeah, which is like a hip hop thing isn't it to just take something that already exists and turn yeah. it into something else but I mean I, I mean all writers do that to a degree you know I used to do that with writers that I liked you know mm. you'd nick a little bit be like I'll nick it but I'll change a little Tweak bit it. so that, that it's not quite such an obvious thing it's an influence rather mm. than a big old chomp you know but yeah NC were uh, good guys you know good friends with, with a lot of them um and they sort of gave me a bit of a second wind. I think really. they gave a lot of people some seconds. Because I'd been around for a long time, but so some of them were from my area and they just started smashing it. And I was like, I'm going to have to get out again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> you know, I'd been on the back foot for a little while. You know, I'd got into other, other things, you know. Certain people had stopped writing, other people had moved away. Uh, and whatever. I'd got into doing martial arts and other other things that had mm. sort of taken over for a little bit, girlfriends and, and whatever. The usual and suspects. The usual things. And then, you know, yeah. Um, so the NT guys from around my way. And then I started doing stuff with them. And they were like, you know, really cool with me. They're, they're about six or six, the, the ones that were from my area were about six or seven years younger than me. You know, and they were all positive and nice to me, saying, oh, yeah, you're a big influence on us starting out in the first place. Oh, I'd be really cool to paint with you. And I, yeah, yeah, of course, I'd love to paint with you. You guys are killing mm, it. Killing it, yeah. You know? And then it was like, do you want to go and do some panels? And I was like, oh, I haven't done a panel for a couple of years. You know? And they were like, the don't worry. The heat was on. The heat was on because, say, I'd been to jail for it and, yeah. and whatnot. 
but I hadn't done anything for a little while and they were like, we know some sweet spots. Don't need to worry, you know. <laughs> so then I started doing a few things with them uh, locally. Hmm. And then I, so then I met Arrow and, and that. I mean, the first time I met Arrow, we went to France and did whole cars. The day that I met him. Yeah, it's just a casual, you know, whole car. <laughs> yeah. That is so fucking arrow, man. It's yeah, like, it is. Yeah. It's go hard or go home. For you but uh, me and him, you know, he's, he's good pal. Me and, me and him hit it off because, you know, he's he's older, he's about five years older than me, but we're both massive hip-hop fans and, and record collectors. His funk collection is so fucking as soon, as soon as we met, you know, there was music on in the car and we're just chatting and we both just, yeah, we're on the same mm-hmm. wavelength, mm-hmm. you know. We're both going... We were, we were on a mission, you know. So Verge had organised it. We were, going to, we were going to France. We used to get the ferry across and then drive for a, for a little while to a place that they'd found where you could just go and do whole cars on the station. And then you'd spend the night there, go and have a couple of beers, get on the ferry and come home again. Did that quite a few times, you know. When you go and do, like, an international trip like that, do, do you ever feel like you... Because you travel so far and you do this thing, but you don't... You don't get to appreciate it thereafter. You have to kind no. of. How's that? How's that? How's that no, feel? I mean that's. I mean that's part of graph. I mean, you can't always. You know, loads of people say you can't expect your stuff to last forever, and a lot of the time you do it for the flick, especially train riders. You do it for the flick, and then you bounce because a lot of the. So, when we were doing trains in the UK, they never got put into service. They didn't run like they're doing at the moment. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. if a train got if a train got um, got painted, got pieced up then they would just be taken out of service mm. and they would run other trains and then they would just ghost it in the middle of the night to the buff and, you know, it would get photographed by BTP and that was the last that was ever seen of it. Every now and again, you might get lucky and just do a train in an afternoon that was just happening to go into service and they hadn't noticed They hadn't noticed the piece on the end of it. Can you imagine, like, if BTP released a, a bona fide book of graffiti... Honestly, just it would be insane. amazing. When, when so thinking back, <laughs> I can't to my, even believe thinking I'm bringing back, this up. Thinking back to my court case again, because they do make portfolios. Like when we were, when we were, uh, I remember sitting in the Crown Court, and we knew that we were done. We knew that it was over. Yeah, the police, over, the yeah. police knew that we were done. We knew we were mm. done, and they, and we'd actually got to know the BTP by this point. And even though we hadn't said anything, we. Or we hadn't grasped anyone up. We'd no commented it like ninety nine percent of the way. He just he just went here, hey, lads. You might as well have a look. And he gave us like this A three portfolio of all of our how many, how many all of our trains. Well, it must have been an inch thick. And it must have, and it must have had you know I think maybe maybe two on each page with a little. He saw your little, eyes like little that. Little That's writer. what happened. And we were just sat there in the court and my mum was just giving me evils. Like, you should not be sitting there enjoying that. You're about to go to jail, you know. <laughs> wow. I mean, we, in fact, we didn't actually know we were going to go to jail at that point. We, we knew that we were, guilt, we were guilty and we were, we were awaiting sentencing. We thought we were probably just going to get a big fine. We were quite surprised, actually, when, we got, when, they, when he called it out mm. and said, you know, custodial. It was like, oh, shit. Yeah, didn't see that one coming. Didn't see that one coming, really. Mm. Uh, because our bar- we had barristers and stuff with it being Crown Court, and the barrister was going, oh, no, 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 no. You're just going to get loads of community service and a big fine and mm. whatever, conditional discharges and all of that. But in the end, the judge said no. But It's kind of like a, a, ro- a wrong to passage, isn't it? Yeah. It's like, on one hand... And you can only look at it, for, take it from experience. I know it might be a little bit hard for your your parents to to, to process, but when you're when you're the real deal, and you go through that thing, particularly for that era, more so. For, I'm actually talking. I am actually talking through this era of the '90s, because um, they were so severe. Like you can only respond to that with creative output you can only really process it as a well i've already i've just had that happen to me like yeah. it would be it wouldn't be worth that having happened to me if if i don't i don't know what do you think i don't know i think at that point i was just so apathetic you know i just didn't care about anything it was all just having a laugh with my mates mm. you know and i 
you know, it always niggled me like, oh, you know, so about the family and stuff. Some people probably think that that's a bit pussy or whatever, but I'm close with, with, my, mm. with my family. Mm. But I still couldn't help it, you know. Mm. I was like, I've got to do it. I've got to mm. do a mission. I had so many close calls, even after I got out of jail, you know. We had only about a year maybe after that, maybe not even that, we just had the biggest chase, like, ever. Talk to me about that. That was, it was insane. Well, me and uh, me and Hooks had been up in London painting. It was a full-on graph day. So we'd been to Crystal Palace. We'd done pieces at Crystal Palace. And we'd arranged to do a certain yard that night. So we arranged to meet our pals there who couldn't come up in the daytime. But they said, all right, we'll meet you by the yard. Mm. We'll bring a load more paint for you. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, we'll, and we'll hit it. And it was a yard that we used to do all the time, quite regularly. When we got there, our mates also turned up with two writers from Newcastle and a couple of their <laughs> pals from the pub. <laughs> and then also, we're going, all right, okay, all right, fuck it, you know. We'll, we'd all had a couple of beers and that, you know. We'll just go in. Everyone just... Sounds like just, a recipe for disaster, Yeah, man. but then we've walked over to the yard and um, TPG were hiding in the bushes. And it was three the three main guys from Brighton who were TPG. Yeah. And one of our lot knew knew them and he was like, oh my God, you know who that is? And the rest of us hadn't met him and this was the biggest train writer in the country, obviously, you know mm-hmm. what I'm talking about. Mm-hmm. And uh, we were like, is that him? And everyone's like, yeah. And then they all come over and they were like, right, we've come all the way here from Brighton. We're doing this yard. We can all go in. Because it was quite, it was a fairly easy yard normally. Jesus and they Jeez. were like, we'll all go in, but no one do anything stupid. Yeah. Everyone, just do your pieces, shut up, and we're all going. Because yeah. they knew what they were doing a lot more than us, you know. We weren't that clued up. And he was going, aren't you wearing gloves? And we were going, no, I don't need gloves. And he was like, you, got, you don't wear gloves? Well, we would just say, we, we, didn't, we, weren't, really that, we weren't really that clued up on, on, on the safety of mm-hmm. things like people are now. And we were, say, a bit stupid. Anyway, we went and done it. Everyone was just piecing. Everyone done their pieces. We were all taking photos at the end, and then the yard just got rushed by trackies, like about 10 of them. And there's about 10 of us, about 10 of them, and it was just like shit. And there's a, there was a police station literally about half a mile down the road, so they're straight on the phone. Everyone is just split into different directions. A couple of us stick together, you know, uh, I might as well say, Nick was like, you two, you know this area, I'm coming with you, get me out of here. So he stuck with me and my pal, and we all, different people were going, I'm going to go that way, I'm going to go that way, I'm going to go that way. And within like a couple of minutes, it was, you could already hear the fucking sirens go in. We were like, they're coming, they're coming, everyone go, 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 go now. Mm-hmm. And uh, we, we all like, hid, we hid out for a little while, you know, it's it you know, it about two o'clock in the morning, something like that. So we were, we were hiding under a tree in someone's back garden. And we left it for, a, for about an hour. And then we thought, right, let's just walk that way and we'll just, we'll just see what happens. We, there's nothing else we could do. It was mm. either, it was, we either stay here all night mm. and possibly get found or we, we start moving. Mm. You know, so we started, we started moving. We got right to near where the, train, the local train station was. And all of a sudden, a copper come out of an alleyway from nowhere, and he was just like, "You three, stay there." Oh. And so we've just gone, oh. poof, legged it as we've we've run into to his car park. Another police cars come in. Just I can't remember who it was, whether it was me or my mate. Now, one of us jumped straight over the bonnet. We run over the other side. The coppers have both jumped out of the car. We're running over the bridge. I've gone over. My mate's gone over. Nick's behind us. He had his rucksack and the cop has gone, poof, grabbed his rucksack that was on his back and he's just gone, poof, wiggled out. Wiggled out of his rucksack. The cop has gone, bang, flat on his face in this <gasps> metal bridge. You can hear him go, fuck. <laughs> We've just dashed down the other side and we're gone, you know. And we were just poof, off, hopping fences and whatever. And within minutes, you could hear the, and then we're like, fucking hell, now is the chopper. And then the chopper came in. Within a few minutes after that, you could hear the dogs, row, 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 and there was sirens just going off everywhere, like absolutely everywhere. And because unbeknown to us, 
our other mates were getting spotted in other different places and they were having their own sort of little individual oh my God. chases and whatever going on. And it was absolutely mad. I was so I was shit myself. I'd only been out of jail for less than a year. I was thinking, fuck, I'm going back, you know. And eventually I went, right, I'm going on my own. He went, I'll see you later. It's too bait. He was like, I'm going on my own. Can't stick together. See you later. I'm gone. And he he gone. I think he I think he gave one of us his phone number because we didn't we didn't we didn't know him. He said, you know, we'll meet up again. Anyway, so he he'd gone. Me and my mate was hiding underneath a, a rabbit hutch in somebody's back garden, but we could just hear the dogs and stuff going on the other side, and you could see the torch lights and all of that going. That rabbit hutch probably saved your fucking ass. <laughs> it probably did, yeah, from the from the chopper or whatever. And, the, and also the smell like of yeah, something possibly, else. That maybe, you. maybe, maybe. But we were just we we stayed there for an hour, and we the chopper was going round and round in circles. The dogs, the police, you could hear police motorbikes going up and down, and we just. We just stayed there and uh, held out and eventually we just waited for all the noise to die down. And uh, it, all, it all calmed down. And all we had, all we had between us, because so, we were younger back then, we only had a tenner. And we were a good 40 or 50 miles away from where we lived. And, uh, but my mate, my mate was like, well, I've got a bank card, but there's no cash points around here. He's got a tenner. So we went to pay phones, as it was back then. No one had... No one really had mobiles or anything. Mm. Managed to find a taxi. Taxi come and picked us up. He got the taxi to drive us to another town. Uh, he got some more money out of the cash point. Uh, and then got enough to get another taxi back to, back to where we lived. And then, this is the worst bit really, I got home, I cleared all the stuff out of my house, still live with my mum and dad at this point, Got everything, everything out. Went and hid it. Put it all in a plastic bag. Hid it behind my dad's shed. Because when they, when you live with your mum and dad, if BTP search your house, they're only allowed to search your room. Right. They're not allowed to search the whole house because it's not your property. Okay, got you. So I, and I knew that from having been done a couple of times before. So I stashed everything. I got into bed. I'd literally been in bed about ten minutes, and there was ding dong, and I knew I was like, it's fucking BTP. And I thought, how the fuck? How the fuck did they get me? How'd they get me? How'd they find me? And I just stayed in bed, you know, I'd scrubbed all the paint off my hands. I just stayed in bed and I thought, I can't answer it, I can't answer it. I could hear my dad getting up, going downstairs. How was it? What, how was your blood levels at this point? Uh, my heart was just... Getting it out. <laughs> yeah, it's pounding now, just talking about it, telling the story. I'm telling it, you, this is the story of 2021, man. That was, that's like, well, this is one of the hardcore... Well, so I, I, I swear to God, I'm not... Right, I, I ain't even finished. Woo, <laughs> carry on. So, like, um, I knew it was BTP. My dad's just come back upstairs, proper pissed off, as you can imagine. Slung the door open, he's gone, bloody BTP again. What have you been doing? And he went, get up, you know. I said, I come downstairs, there's two coppers in the front room. And they've said, you know, you're under arrest for criminal damage, blah, 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 da, da, da. And they said, you're, what had happened was my bank card was in my back pocket. I didn't even realise that I dropped it. My bank card was found on the tracks by the yard. And they tracked it and got me back. But luckily, by the time all that had happened, I'd got home, cleared everything out anyway. And I was thinking, they didn't even know at this point that I had previous, you know. So anyway, I was nicked, was taken to the police station. No comment, no comment, as per usual. And they've come in, they've come in, just found out, you've been in jail for this, haven't you? And I was like, no comment, no comment, no comment. Okay, released on bail. And then, you know, a couple of days, weeks later, whatever it was, I had a phone call, you need to come to a certain BTP station in London, do a line, do a ID parade mm. thing. So I went up there to do that. And it was amazing. I walked in and I... They had like ten blokes who looked exactly like me, <laughs> and I thought they're never going to pick me out. Yeah. I couldn't believe it. You know, they were all sort of, you know, I was a bit scruffy, a lot more scruffy at the time than I was now. All sort of scruffish blokes with the same colour hair as me, <laughs> amazing. Sort of baggy jeans and trainers and hoodies. And I was like, brilliant. <laughs> anyway, and I, so I did the lineup, and they had the taxi driver that had driven us home. They had two of the trackies from the yard that reckoned that they'd clock people Jesus. and they had the two coppers that had 
nearly got us by the station, and none of them, none of them picked me out. And uh, so, you know, all charges got dropped. And then this is the mad, this is the maddest thing about the whole story. About a week later, after I'd had my charges dropped, the the BTP sergeant who had done me in my prior case phoned me up and said, I found out, heard about that you got nicked in that again. He said, I can't believe I'm doing this. He said, I've got your rucksack here. And I was thinking, my rucksack. And it was yeah. it was it was Mr. Nasty's rucksack yeah. that they'd pulled off his back when the copper had fallen flat on his stage. And he went, I'll drop it round your house. And then so a couple of days later, the sergeant from BTP dropped this rucksack round my house, half full cans of paint from that mission. Oh my and went, right, hope I don't see you again, and just went. And I, you know, I had his number by this point, and I phoned him up and I said, You'll never guess what's just happened. And he's like, What? I said, You know your rucksack? I said, I've got it here. And he's just going, What? Wow. And I met up with him. This was in 1995. And uh, Unity, do you remember the jams that yeah, Elk, of Elk used to do? I yeah. think it was the second one in 95. I can't remember how many. Was there two or three? Three. It was three. It was three, yeah. Anyway, it was the, I'm sure it was the 1995 one. Yeah. So. He said, are you going to Unity in a couple of weeks? I was like, yeah, yeah, of course I am. He was like, right, well, I'll see you there. So I turned up at Unity with his rucksack and I've just gone out there and he's gone, I don't fucking believe it. Mind blown. <laughs> Mind blown. I know. And I gave it to him and he was like, he was like, I can't believe, I can't believe that none of us, that only one person got caught that night and I can't believe the one person who did caught, got, got away with it and brought me my rucksack back. You can't write that. <laughs> you just can't write this. It's incredible. That was, that's an incredible story. Yeah, and, and all the other writers, so that's just my part of the story. Everyone else who was there that night has got their own little bit of that as well. <laughs> like the two, the, two, the two Geordie writers that were there that night as well, when everybody else was getting chased all over the place, do you know what they did? They just went down the shop, bought a couple of beers and just walked onto the station and got the train home. What? Yeah. Was it like nothing, not, not like, As if nothing had happened, they were just like, oh, fuck it, man, let's go and get a beer, like. That's how they do it up north, man. That's how they know, do it in Newcastle. And they, what? and they were covered in paint, and they just walked straight to the station, sat on a bench, drinking their beers on the station, and got the train back to where they were staying down south. Wow. And other, other, pe other people walked like 40 miles all the way home, hmm. all, th all through the night. And other people sort of hid out all night and then bunk trains back to wherever in the morning. But yeah, that was we call that Black Sunday. That Black was, Sunday. That was a legendary, <sighs> mad, mad, mad night. So it... that was twenty five years ago, but that, I'll never ever forget that. Have you ever told that story? I, I've never told it to anyone like yourself. There's obviously writers, my mates and stuff who know yeah. the story. There's a few people that were there. Uh, Sounds like. You know the beach scene in Quadrophenia? It sounds like that, <laughs> but in it. <laughs> you know what I mean? It was, oh, it's, yeah. Just brutal, like levels of people just yeah. running everywhere. It was absolute, absolute mayhem. Absolute mayhem. And then, you know, a few weeks later, it was all forgotten. So we see all them lot. I mean, we did it. We had a few more missions. You know, I'm not best mates with the TPG guys. I'm not trying to claim that, you know, drop loads of names or anything. You know, I did a few missions with them after that. And again, there was no mobile, so I think either you know we lost each other's number or people changed numbers, and then I didn't see him again. Uh. Didn't see him again for for quite a long time, and then maybe randomly bumped into him again. But uh, yeah, had, had, you know, they were mad mad times in the nineties, weren't they? Yeah. So then later on, ended up doing a few things with with NT, and and then later on from NT, it went into the uh, the heavy artillery. Yeah, let's yeah. briefly touch touch on that subject because I'm I'm a, I'm a big heavy artillery fan, you know, and I've had a number of guests from the, that squadron come yeah, through. Yeah, I know. Um, we kind of spoke about it before. There was the moment that it was like a, a you know a tight knit crew, and then it expanded and went into all different countries and directions. You were very much part of the 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 beginnings, the inception of it, yeah. and the the, the regionalised version of it. What was that like back then? That was, they was, they were good times, you know. So we were all people that were painting together, that were all in different crews, really. Mm. Um, I was in a crew 
called War Crew at the time, which was more of a local crew from our area with um, Dest and Jabs and a few others. Mm. And uh, I was going down at Brighton a lot, I was doing a lot of stuff with NT, and then there was guys from you know like Odyssey and stuff who were... What crew was he in at the time? Was he in RK or one of those other Brighton crews, maybe? There was a lot of crews coming out of Brighton. There was a lot of crews in Brighton, yeah. They were... I don't know who they were. Compl- I mean, they. You go down to Brighton; it's like a whole different. Ecosystem. Yeah, but they all, they all knew each. They all knew, and they all knew each other. They were all friends with each other, yeah. just like the Brighton guys are now. You've got all you know. There's loads of them in there. Yeah, so yeah, I'm yeah. going to start That's dropping right. loads of names, but. Uh, but Gyro, you know, Gyro, who's from Liverpool, he'd moved down to Brighton. He was doing stuff with us, and um, Gary was really starting to mm. do loads of mad, mad stuff. And we were playing together all the time. And uh, I think Arrow and Odyssey sort of started it and yeah. said, you know, every artillery to kind of link those two together. And then later on, you know, other people got, got asked into it and they were like, you know, we've got a good little crew here. You know, it was like Alert from Nottingham, mm. good friend of mine. Oh, tight Top man, alert. that's someone you need to get on. I need someone, I need some f- alert in my life. Nottingham crew, hell tight. He's the man, yeah. Yeah, for sure. So anyway, there was those six... The originals, me, Arrow, Alert, Odyssey, Gyro, and Gary. That's mad in itself. And we, you know, so we were doing, we were, we were, we were painting regular, you know, mainly Halls of Fame, you know, but we were trying to do a lot of um, touring and and getting about a bit, you Mm -hmm. know. We were going to Italy and France and hooking up with various different writers. That's how some of these other people ended up being in the crew, you know. Yeah. But we were getting, you know, that was the time when Flickr and all that was just starting mm. popping, wasn't it? Yeah. You know? and all the pictures. And we so, so we started doing the heavy artillery thing on Flickr and, you know, we were getting a lot of, getting a lot of love from people from all over the world and we were like, oh, right, this is cool, you know, mm. let, let's sort of keep, let's keep this going. It's crazy how early this is for heavy artillery. You know. you know, so but it was a six and then I can't even remember what order other people came in, like yeah. Roids came in and, and Relay came in, and then some of the lads from abroad, like Storm and Gebbers from Copenhagen, who you met. Old um, tight Gebbers, yeah. Yeah, old tight Storm and Gebbers, yeah. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Mr. Waney from Milan, uh, Viper from Milan. And, oh, you know, there was, it became a bit of a bit of a big crew. And it, big they, deal, yeah. They're starting, you know, starting to go places, and, you know, a lot of them were sponsored, you know, like getting free paint and just... Did graffiti for their jobs, and they were really, really, really hammering it. And I kept up with them for, uh, I don't know, a couple of years. And after a while, I was like, you know, I just, they were going at a different rate to what mm. I was going at, to be honest. Mm. And I'm still cool with all of them, you know. Mm-hmm. Some of them are some, I would count amongst my best friends. Um, we had loads of great missions together, you know. Not just, I'm not talking illegal missions now. I'm talking like our sort of, Graph holidays when mm-hmm. we did the I don't know if we were the first but we did like a a tour of California you know sort of six six UK writers and we did Los Angeles uh San Francisco and San Diego nice. stayed, stayed out there for two weeks key areas yeah. did loads of places obviously um a couple of them ended up being in MSK Mega influential super crew, influential, super yeah. crew, you know, yeah. and we were painting with with them, and again, it was just to me, you know, I, I was pleased to be painting with heavy artillery, and then I mean, paint with some of those MSK guys, you know, they are, oh, that's ne- crazy, they are just next, they are, they are like next level, like Premier Champions League, but you guys, when it comes you, to you took it to the mountain. to burners and, yeah. and whatever, I just couldn't believe, I just couldn't believe it, you know, so I, I I'm. I'm definitely not on the same level as even as Arrow or other people in this country. But when you know, we went over there and saw like, Revoke and that, and it was just pff, yeah, know. mad. You know, when you saw how up they were in Los Angeles, how big Los Angeles is, mm. and he was up like all city in Los Angeles, mm. rooftops, billboards, track sides, burners, mm. you know, like every everywhere, and the legal Absolute, system everywhere down the highway. Crazy. You know, and it was like a real top quality, you know. And when I watched them paint, they painted so, so good, so fast. And really? Was, yeah. And it was, I mean, you know that LA takedown wall that we, that we did? Yeah. That was the year before we did the, the tour. 
we did that LA takedown. Four. We? Yeah, we went to we went to LA two years in a row. So right. we went. I think we went in two thousand and seven. Me, Odyssey, Gary, and Arrow went just us four. And we did the LA takedown wall with Revoke and Sever. Persuay from San Diego and Sabre painted next to it. But we did that. We did that wall. But anyway, when we when we were doing that. Like that was right in the middle of downtown Los Angeles, Heavy, like yeah. as like as central, you know, as you could get, really, mm. right by where all the banks were and loads of businesses. Yeah, yeah, in this yeah. sort of on the side of an antique shop that was, in this sort of disused car park area. Mm. Re Revoke had hooked up the wall for us, and uh, but when he did it, he was like, "I can't paint here in the daytime because he's too hot." Because he was too wanted all over. LA yeah. so we were like alright well what are you going to do he's like well I'll come down and hang out he said I'll do some bass feel for you on some of the you know had all the buildings with the mm. the, the big fight scene going on in the middle he was like I hope you do some roller in I'd block fill some of those buildings and, and stuff like that he said but I'll, I'll have to do my piece at night mm. he said oh, you know that piece took us five days because it's that was massive massive yeah. massive massive piece and uh, yeah he said I'll, I'll have to do it one not one evening because we were painting until about eight o'clock at night, you know. And, and Those warm summer nights in Los Angeles, oh, mate. Yeah. Honestly, I don't know if you ever saw that photo of my neck that was on Flickr, but it, it was. <laughs> oh, you do really torch your neck. <laughs> it was like it's like know, a new was, form of it, salmon pink. There was, it was. I mean, there was nowhere to hide from the sun there, and it was it was LA summer, yeah. absolutely baking hot. Didn't matter how much sun cream or whatever you put on, you were getting some Busted, getting yeah. sunburn. Anyway, back to sort of revoke, you know, he said I was doing my piece at night and he, his piece, and if you remember the piece, it's got three pieces on one side. It's got revoke, arrow, odyssey. Yeah. And on the other side, it's got Gary, wrench, sever with the fight scene in the middle. Revoke did his piece, I think, in about an hour and a half in the dark with a box full of dregs. And I was on, a, on, a, on a scaffold and I was just... Just, I was just going, I can't believe what I'm seeing this. It's one of my favourite writers. Yeah. And he's just there going, just chucking cans. Like, I was only half in there. Well, Vogue don't fuck about. You know, when he was in London, he fucking did some really nice stuff, didn't he? You know, Insane. He, he could, he, you know, I just couldn't believe watching him paint. And when we did, did track sides with him and stuff like that in, in LA, and I was just like, you know, and what I did compared to what they did, I was just, they just made me feel proper shit, you know. Oh, dude. I mean... I Again, we kind of alluded at the start, you know, it's um, it's rare people get to have these conversations on podcasts and have the legacy to back it up. You've, you've got the legacy to back it up and this is why these stories are just undocumented and fucking awesome. Um, you you have these moments where you, you're, you're with your peers and I, it's the same with me with beatboxing and I, I'm sure it's with a lot of people, even though they don't care to admit it too often, you're gonna feel that way with Revoke, right? If that's just the deal. I did a stinking track side and I, I was so pissed off. We all went out to do, well, not all of us, I think a couple of people didn't go, but me, Arrow, Alert, Rhyme, and Revoke went and did some track sides in LA. We went to try and do the LA River. This is another iconic. Yeah, this is another little bit of a story, but we went to do the LA River because mm. we, we thought it's iconic, got to do that, get photos of that. Easy. Start, walk down, we were starting to walk down the top of the the bank, big concrete bank thing or whatever, and there was all gangbangers all hanging out there down there doing drugs, and they all just started legging it towards us, and Revoke was just like, get the fuck out of here now, you know, so we would just turn around and just legged it back to the car, and all these gang gangbangers were fucking chasing us, and just hopped over the fence, got all back into the Revoke's Jeep, and just... Fuck that! Fucking <laughs> pelted off, and he's like, oh, fucking hell, that was close, because, you know... they got guns. Yeah, well, they... God knows what. what you know, and there's just territory, mad territorial, you know, in LA and parts of America. And uh, anyway, so we ended up doing track sides, and I've got, oh, I think I was slap bang in the middle, and I've got revoke and alert on one side of me, and I've got arrow and rhyme on the other side of me, and I just did the shittest piece in the middle of four tough crowd, fucking man. Tough crowd. And I, honestly, I was so pissed off. I was really, I was fucking upset. <laughs> and they were all going, Renchi, it's all right, mate, don't worry. I'll were you down. literally on the floor? <laughs> I was on the floor. Oh, fuck's <laughs> sake. Uh, oh, no. tight. King anyway. Wrench getting, <laughs> <laughs> feeling a bit burnt, not just from the neck. Fucking school. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Got fucking destroyed by four fucking top writers, but 
Anyway, live and learn, don't you? What a story, though. I mean, this is you're not sure of story. So you're a hip hop guy. I'm a big hip hop guy. Yeah, that's. I mean, that's how that's the root of how I got into all of this in the first place. I suppose, mm. as we said, through hip hop connection and yeah, big hip hop guy. So I've had phases where I, I make beats and collect records and breaks and all of that stuff as mm. well. So I've had that's where I've been in and out of graffiti. Sometimes I've been more into making beats and digging mm. for a year or so. We've we've crossed paths before as well. We we have crossed paths before. Yeah, yeah. A couple of times. The jams. The jams. Well, so you used to come. You used to come to. Prone's jams in, in Reading, didn't yeah, you? Yeah, that's right. When you was... Hold tight, Prone. Hold tight. Big up, Prone. All I mean, day. Prone was, again, I should have mentioned Prone and DRS earlier, actually. You know, majorly influential of the scene in, in our area. And he, some, yeah. some of the or- originals. And Prone used to be doing wicked pieces. DRS and all that were doing wicked pieces. But Prone DRS. is... A, every, any, anyone who knows Prone knows he's a, he's a hip-hop legend. You know, crate yeah. digger, producer, DJ whatever, you know, he put on all these hip-hop nights yeah. uh, locally to us and, you know, he was bringing Jurassic 5, Company Flow, Swollen Members. Put me on first, I was one of the first people it, we put Yeah, me on. and so you lot were, were doing your 360 physicals yeah. thing with people from our area, used yeah. to come out. And so we met then, yeah. but the other time that we met, you, you probably won't remember, but this will surprise you, we had breakfast together in Germany. Yeah. A battle of the year. I think it was um, 2002, 2001, yeah. maybe. Yeah, like that, yeah. Did we? I don't know if you remember, but you was. I think you you were performing. Yeah. And we were staying in the same hotel, and I was with a couple of other British lads, and you come down the stairs on your on your own, and we were like, or one of my mates was like, "Yo, Keller." And you were like, oh, are you like English? Because, you know, when you go to Battle of the Year, it's all just French, German, yeah, Dutch, yeah. you know. There's, there's, English people don't really go to it. You get, a, you get a few sometimes. And so you come up, you was like, are you English? And you were like, yeah, yeah. You, and you said, oh, can I come and chill with you lot? So you come and... No way, come, yeah. that's fucking sick. <laughs> that's so like you come and sat down with us and uh, yeah, we had a bite and a chat. And Who else was there? Because this is really... Well, we didn't even... One of, one of them was... Wasn't even a writer. The other one was a writer. But I don't think we even said that we were writers. We probably, we might not have even mentioned it. I can't remember because sometimes you don't when you're yeah. a, when you're a writer. So, and it's not, nothing yeah. to do necessarily personal. You don't. You guys don't. But sometimes sometimes we just like you better not say nothing. You know. Sometimes I've been in a pub and someone's chatting and people start talking about graffiti. Oh, I went down to Brighton the other day. Saw loads of good graffiti. And my mate's going, you know, nudging you, and I'm just like. You know, yeah. I leave I it. I just leave it. Leave I don't it. want to have this conversation with them. I know exactly or, what you mean. I get with beatbox as well. It's like that, don't even ask me to do it. Yeah. Don't even, <laughs> in fact, don't even bring it up. Sometimes I just avoid it, and then the missus will go, "Why didn't you say anything?" I was like, yeah. "Trust me, it's just it's long." Yeah, <laughs> and it, it does become an political, so, politically fueled as yeah, well. Yeah, so that was that was the time we met, and we you know we, we painted. What was that? Was that? Place called what was it? Was it Braunschweig or somewhere yeah, like that? Yeah, yeah. It was way out there, wasn't it? It's in the middle of nowhere, yeah. Dude, I, I actually come back from Canada at that point, and I know it because I know the video and the T-shirt I was wearing. I got it actually in Canada, so I was jet lagged. So I was probably on a whole different time zone. <laughs> to get there was really hard. Yeah, I think you might have mentioned that there actually being jet lagged. Now you say it, but yeah, I mean that was. I mean, what was that? That's twenty years ago, isn't it? Twenty years ago, boy. Yeah, <laughs> but we so. used to go to a lot of them Battle of the Years. Just for the crack, you know. None of us were breakers or anything, but we were like, it's a good chance to go to go abroad, get pissed up, mm. go listen to some hip hop, watch some wicked dancing, go and do some pieces, mm. have a bit of a lads' holiday, uh, and and come back again. It's wicked. Yeah, we went, we went about four or five times, I think, to Battle of the Year. Some of the best dancing. That was, oh man, that was mad. One year there as well. I, I didn't go, but some of the lads all sneaked off. They went, oh, we're going to go and do some panels. And I was like, I'd pissed up already. If most of us were, and we were like, oh, we we're just staying here. Yeah. And three of them went off to do some panels. The rest of us had a good night out, went back to where we were staying, and then where, where we were staying got raided by German police at like three o'clock in the morning, where two of them had been caught, one of them got away. And you're like, here we go and again. We were like, it was like, here we go again. <laughs> yeah. And they walked in going, do you know this person? You know this person? And we just went, no, I don't know what he's talking about. Yeah, yeah we just, just like, British passport, guys. passport, you know. We showed them our passports. Uh, they found out what rooms our mates were in. I think they 
confiscated any Stuff. contraband that might yeah. have been in the room. And then that was the last, that was the night before we were coming back to England as well. And we couldn't get hold of them. We didn't know where the hell police station or anything they were because the police just came in. So they were bagged and they, you could Yeah, they were bagged. We didn't, they, we, you know, we knew who it was who'd been bagged, but we didn't know what had happened. We just knew they'd been bagged, you know, and we knew that they were going to do panels. So we were guessing they'd been either caught trespassing or before or during or after the act. Anyway, we, so we woke up in the morning going, what the fuck are we going to do about them two? And we were like, don't know, find a few police stations, I think, couldn't, couldn't find out where they were. Then the other one who'd been with them who'd got away, he came back was going, oh, God, you know, it's a fucking nightmare. I was hiding underneath a train for three hours. I was fucking well lucky I didn't get caught, blah, blah, blah. What happened? He was like, did you get raided? And like, yeah, they've got raided. They've taken all their stuff. And he was going, oh, fucking hell, it's my stuff here. I was going, yeah, your stuff's here because they didn't know that you were, <laughs> you were with them. We've got your stuff. We've packed it all up. And we were in a minibus literally just about to go back to England. And oh. we, were dri- you know, and we were driving out of this city... <laughs> With all the stuff, and unbelievably, we see the two of them walk, walking down the road. Jeez! And we were just like, "Get in! Fucking get in!" Proper eighteen <laughs> moment. <Yeah. laughs> you know, and then they told us. Don't what, forget they, the droids. They told us what happened. And they were like, "Oh, we've we haven't we haven't been charged. We've been we've been we've been bailed or whatever." Uh, and they've said that they'll be in touch, and I don't think anything ever ever came with it. I think I think one of them maybe got a fine in the post that he never paid or something, you know. So that's what that's that's the thing with other... Actually, I'll tell you what, the, here's the thing. When a, a, an event like Battle of the Year comes on, you'd think that the air, whole area from a radius of like 10 miles... It was. That side. was why they got caught. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, bait. it's like, yeah, what, what you mean there there's 8,000 eight, 8, uh, hip-hop heads descending into yeah. one small... <laughs> that means you've probably got at least 500 writers. Yeah. You know, so... Fucking super high alert. Yeah, but anyway, they, they tried and... And failed, and yeah, another another story. But yeah. hip hop is, uh, is 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 has has this presence even in graph now, which it, it, it it's okay. There's other music forms that come in and out and play, and cultures yeah. change, and you know the flavors of the the, the season. You know, the, it's a constant. Graph seems to have this way of forming and working alongside it. You know, whatever the new trend is, but um, at its core, you know, hip hop. That it, it's def- definitively street culture, isn't it? You can't. There's no two ways. Yeah, about I it. think it's one of the, um, well, one of the the origins of modern street culture. Obviously, even like mods and rockers and stuff was hundred percent a street culture. And absolutely, ter- you know, football, you know, terrorist culture is street culture. Yeah, yeah. I'm actually, I might cover, cover that too. I do. Yeah, hip hop yeah. is obviously the root of drum and bass and grime and all of those kind of things. And graffiti's always been accepted into those as well. You know, graffiti was always on drum and bass album covers and, mm. and whatnot and that as well, wasn't it? Mm. I mean, graffiti is so everywhere now. You know, when we were doing it back in the in the 90s, it was, you know, people weren't didn't know what the hell it was. You mm. know? But didn't know what we were doing. Whereas now, people have grown up with it. People have grown up with graffiti on T-shirts and graffiti on flyers and album covers, and they're just more used to it. And then you've had the whole Banksy effect and all of that stuff that's come as well with with street art and people being more um, accept, you know, accepting of of paintings in the street and, mm. and whatever. Everyone, loads of people still hate tags and stuff, don't they? But there's more places now where piecings accepted more yeah. legal spots you never had legal spots in the 90s right didn't exist you know now you've got places like you know leak street and 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 whatever there might be a few places that were cool like labrick grove and stuff back in the day but yeah. i don't really consider that sort of a street spot you didn't what i'm saying is you didn't have pieces right on the pavement like you do now or like that period in brighton where we were all painting the new england quarter where there mm. was all those boards up mm. And it was just pieces, pieces, pieces all the time, and people just get so used to, yeah. to seeing it. But now it's 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 everywhere now. Graffiti is mm. yeah. graf- graffiti's mad different, but everything everything. Do you evol- like it? Evolves. I don't mind it. You know, everything has to evolve, and it's not going to evolve necessarily the way that you want it to. But you have to accept it. Mm. I think you know. There's loads of things that are different now. There's loads of things that have been different for a long time, you know. I, I, I would say around 2000-ish was the sort of turning point when all the 
uh, the graph paints and all of that started coming mm. out. I can't remember the exact year of when, you know, Molotov mm. started doing the big sort of made for graph color ranges yeah. and then all Montana hardcores and all the other ones that followed yeah. all came out. I remember just coming through Europe like and graph shops and graph magazines yeah. everywhere. You know, when we when we was cu coming up, there weren't all the graph magazines like you've got now. Definitely wasn't the internet. So we, we used to go to Four Star General and that in Camden. Do you remember that little of course, place? Yeah. But he would have a few. He'd have like maybe an explicit graphics from oh, my phone's going, sorry. It's all right. Explicit graphics from Germany or a hype magazine from Australia. Yeah, he used to have like the rarities. He used to uh, have the can control from LA and uh Yeah. Romania. So you'd get a few and you'd get bit and you would stock visual graphics, I think, and that for Kilo. But there weren't really a lot. And then London's Burning, the, mm. the, the, Damn, the fanzine yeah. came out. That was mega influential to a, to a lot of people because that was the first time you'd seen a lot of UK graph all in one That's the first time that's been place. mentioned on podcast. Really? Yeah. I've not I thought that said. would have been dropped loads of times. I mean, yeah. who, who did that? Was it Score? Oh, God, I don't know. I don't know. I just remember it. I mean, I mean, but it had loads of, um, you know, all those cherished... Score, was that you? Answers on the comments. <laughs> I know that it got reissued once as well, a bit later on with a few more things in, but that had all the Cherish, those amazing Cherish end-to-end -end yeah. tubes and stuff. Um, and it had a lot of the stuff, pieces at Three Corners and Tough and all. Yeah. That was where we so first started hearing about a lot of those um, those places. Mm. But so it's, it's mad different now, isn't it? Internet, it's Instagram, you know, yeah. you, can be, you can be world famous in... In three months now, which mm. you know is what it is, you know. But it's not how how we came up. We came up. If you wanted to be known, you had to fucking paint, and you had to travel, and you mm. had to get about. You know that was you know that was how we kind of got good names for ourselves. Not necessarily saying we we were amazing talented writers. I'm just saying we had a good rep for being people. Yeah, they're doing it, man. You yeah, know? yeah. Yeah, because people would see us in Essex. Yeah. People would see us in Bristol. People would see us. In fucking Cambridge, they would see us in Brighton. They would see us our stuff up in London. They were like, you know, they yeah. they're getting up, you know, they're getting about. Where, yeah. who, who are they? Where are they? Where are they from? Mm. And five years later, we were we were still there and thereabouts, you know. So I have dipped in and dipped out, but I've always mm. always kind of done just enough yeah. to make sure that my name don't go away, kind of thing. You know? Yeah, you know that. Um, just on a kind of side note, as you were talking, I. I, I recited something I was thinking the other day and how important it is that people, whether it's a podcast or whether it's um, the new social platform, particularly for artists that have a legacy and have had a historical um, path, because it's important that they get involved in those these things. Um, not for my greater gain, you know what I mean? I'm not going to change the narrative of people that come on the show and, and likewise, I don't think there's... They, your names don't get forgotten when a new social platform comes on. But what I have noticed is when a new TikTok comes on or a new um, a new version of Instagram or whatever, um, the, the line in the sand is drawn, unfortunately, for people that choose not to go on board and get involved with it. Yeah. And that's unfortunate because all of a sudden, because these new platforms, they get immediate attention for anyone that gets on there first because they've got lots of space to fill and content needs to be yeah. supplied. So if you're a mediocre artist, whether it's graph or whether it's music, you're mediocre, you get a lot of attention because you're the first one on the platform. And I feel like that's an injust. Yeah, of course it is, but it's all part of the game. I mean, to me, social the social media thing isn't, import, isn't important to me. You know, some, some writers are really on it, hashtagging loads of hashtags yeah, yeah, every yeah. time they do a piece. Which is cool to, too. Get, yeah. Which is fine. If that's yeah. what you want to do, that's what you want to do. But For to sure. me, the amount of likes that I get on Instagram or the amount of followers I've got on Instagram doesn't really mean anything. In fact, if anything, I'm probably the opposite. I probably I don't want too mm. many people following me on mm. Instagram. As I said to you earlier, you know, the respect of my peers means more to me sometimes on Instagram than having a hundred people like, sure. following me or liking stuff. You know, when I see some of the writers that are following me or some of the writers that I don't even know that have sent me cool comments yeah. or 
dropped a little message in, you know, yeah. people saying, oh, I had one the other day, some guy. Uh, and he was like, yeah, man, you know, do you remember me? I met you in in uh, at Tufnell. Again, it was Tufnell. He said, I met you at Tufnell years ago with so-and-so and so-and-so. I was like, you know, that's cool. And people linking that's up. Cool. So he remembers me from, from yeah. 20 years ago and saying, and being, having people that you really respect like your pieces, that means, that means more to me. So when, mm. when uh, people like, um, Arrow or Score or whoever are like, yeah, that's top draw, mate. Or say even people that I don't know. So I don't know Score. I've never, I've never met him. We've had a couple of chats mm. o- online about maybe doing some stuff. But you know, when he's sending me positive comments saying it's good to see you painting again, and I've never, he doesn't even know me. You know, mm. that means more to me because I respect people like him so much. Him. Yeah, yeah. And saying so, there's other, there's plenty of other writers. I'm not going to name loads of names. You know, um, but like Act from TB, TBF oh, as well you know yeah. I, I don't you know I don't know that guy but he started following me you know a little while ago and I'm like he's fucking great but that but stuff like that that just means because I'm like that, that's a real writer you know I think those you're absolutely right numbers don't mean nothing if you're not got just those perks you know it's like someone commenting or yeah. you know DMing you saying yeah I just want to say you're fucking doing great and it's those sorts of things that spur you on it's your, it's your, it's yeah. your peers isn't it yeah absolutely so I've, I've, I've not been active really recently as I, as I told you but you know I'm really sort of quite hungry again to get out and do stuff again at the moment I say serves you right <laughs> you can't get away from it it's like being a smoker isn't it you know you know, as soon as you as soon as you pick up a can again, it's like picking up a cigarette again. It's yeah, like, you yeah. like you like that's it. It's not again. I bet. Yeah. <laughs> I've done a few things recently, and now you know I'm hassling my my missus and saying I want to go painting. I want to go painting. And uh, to her, it's quite new because because she met me around a time where I wasn't doing a lot of stuff. What she say when you do it? Well, I t- well no, she likes she she likes me do- she likes me doing it. You know, she probably wouldn't like it if I was going out doing um, hardcore missions like I used to do. Mm-hmm. But it's quite happy for me to go down the Hall of Fame and, mm-hmm. you know, do stuff like that because she knows that I'm, I'm a creative person and I need... Creative people need outlets, don't mm-hmm. they? Um, so, yeah, it's good to be... Good to be getting back into it again, you know. Because I've been inspired by a lot of the writers from around my way again recently because the scene has been a lot of new kids... new kids on the block mm-hmm. in our area... Who've been doing a lot of stuff, yeah. And it's a, it's like when the NT started doing stuff. It just makes me. Well, I've got to show them. I've got to show them who I'm about. You know who I am. What, what I'm about. Yeah, yeah. Don't sleep on the OGs. You know. Don't yeah. sleep on the OGs. <laughs> you know I mean? That was a nice tea quote actually. I saw on Instagram the other day, but uh, I sort of it resonated with me a little bit. Not saying I'm mega OG or anything, but he's me- he's mega OG. What a perfect way to end our chat. Thank you so much for passing through the mighty Thank wrench inside the place. Me. Sorry for chewing your ear off. <laughs> no, it's all right. It's all right. It's, it's your podcast, my brother, and I enjoyed every minute. I mean, I love these conversations, as everybody knows. Well, thank you for having me. My head goes off. No, thank you. Uh, I'm going to need another cup of tea in a minute. Yeah, to no. Because that's gone cold. And I'm Rosie Lee in the pot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hold tight, everyone. I hope you enjoyed that. Killer Keller striking with a vengeance with this podcast thing. All right. Sharing is caring. All right. Tell a friend to tell a friend, all right? Do not sleep on that. I repeat, do not sleep on that. Repeat. You stay lucky, people. Peace.